Last week we talked about how the church needs to wake up and pursue its purpose. Today we're going to continue on that topic and we're going to talk about what the church looks like when it has lost its purpose or vision. You have a purpose. You have a calling. Wake up. <laughs> start somewhere. Just start. Stop waiting for somebody else. Stop dreaming that this isn't really happening. This is all just a dream and I'm really just doing what I'm supposed to do. Get out of your comfort zone and start somewhere. Don't pretend anymore that it's all going to be okay. Don't stay asleep and miss your destiny. The church needs to wake up and take its place in the world and the church can only do that if the members of the church do that. The church is only as strong as its weakest member. The body of Christ is only as strong as its weakest part. Okay? If you look at the human body, if you break your leg, you are considered weak. You are a cripple until your leg heals. So if your part is to be the leg in the body of Christ and you're broken, the body of Christ is as strong as a person with a broken leg. They can't run a race. So the body of Christ needs to take care of each other. We need to begin to raise up each other and strengthen each other so that we as a body can go out and reach more people. We must be wise and prepared and ready for what is coming. We must be vigilant and alert so that we can be ready for our groom. Not all churchgoers are a part of the body of Christ. Some churchgoers are fakers, some are pretenders, and some are bound by their iniquity and they are not a part of the body of Christ. We need to take care of those in the body. We need to take care of those members that are struggling in the body so that the body can be stronger. How many people in the body of Christ are asleep? How many people are going to miss what God is doing now? Think about that. How many people would say they're a member of the body of Christ, but you're spiritually asleep? You're not praying every day. You're not reading your word every day. You're not connecting with other believers on a normal basis. So you're asleep. You've fallen asleep in this season of COVID because life is different. It's changed. It's not the same. Well, I've got news for you. Life is different. It has changed and it will never be like it was in 2018 or 2017 or 2010. Life has changed. Things have changed and things are not going to return back to the old ways. Things have adapted and they've progressed forward, but they're never going to go back to the old days. So if you're waiting for that to wake up, forget it. Wake up so that you don't miss what it is that God is doing. Stop making excuses. Excuses are the enemy's weapon to distract you and sedate you, to make you lethargic as a believer. Because if you have an excuse, then it's not your fault. That's what the enemy is telling you. It's not your fault. You couldn't have done anything different. But the truth is that you have the same power that Christ had and you have the same authority that Christ had when he was here on earth. So we need to live on purpose in every season of life and we need to look for the next thing. In Isaiah 43 verse 7 it says, bring all who claim me as their God for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. Another version says that he made them with purpose. So God made each one of us with a purpose 
for a purpose. So it's time that we stop surviving and that we begin thriving. It's time that we wake up and that we get into prayer and we get into the Word and we spend time to figure out what it is that God made you for. If you don't know what your purpose is, you need to seek time with Him to find that purpose. What gifts and talents has He given you? What passions has He given you? And how can you use them to further the Kingdom of God? If you still don't know what your purpose is, then find out what is God's will. And as you read the Bible and you figure out what God's will is, you will begin to figure out where you fit into that plan. The more you seek after His plan, you will begin to find your place in that plan. And once you have the revelation of what God is doing, then it's much easier for us to figure out what we are supposed to do. So many Christians are disconnected from their power source. They have the mistaking, mistaked thinking that the power comes from within them when the power actually comes from God. They're not reading their word. They're not praying. They're only relying on a message that they may hear half of. And so their spiritual bodies are starving. They're malnourished. And because they're starving and they're malnourished, they're sedated, they're drowsy, they're lethargic, they're oppressed and depressed. And it makes their response time to problems, to spiritual attacks, to be delayed. It leaves them open for danger to creep into their life. It numbs their ability to care about others or lost and hurting people because their, their spirit man is starving to death. Maybe their physical man is very healthy and well-built and athletic and, and uh, beautiful, but their spiritual man looks like the weak, weak person with the bones showing and hardly any fat tissue or muscle tissue developed because it's starving to death. It's on the brink of dying because they're not feeding their spirit man. It's so important that we feed both our physical body and our spiritual one. Because if we don't feed that spiritual one, then it begins to affect our ability to do our purpose. There is lost and hurting people out there. They need the church to come to them. They need us to find them and help them. But because the church is starving and sickly, the church has become tolerant of sin. Instead of shunning those people that Paul tells us to shun, we have begun to open up our doors and say, okay, come in. And those people have brought their poison into the church. And they've actually brought their poison in so much that now it's wrong for churches to correct sin. There's certain sins that if the church corrects, they're politically incorrect and they're offensive. And so now the church is afraid. But if the church would stand guard and be alert, then this problem never would have happened. The church has become too much like a sheep and not enough like a lion. The church has become too tolerant. It needs to be more tenacious. It needs to be stronger and more fierce. It needs to stand up for those who cannot. But at the same time, it needs to block out those who do not wish to conform to the Word of God. We need to protect that what God has given us or we'll end up like the Israelites who were lost and they forgot their purpose. Israel was in the wilderness before they took the promised land. And they were the children of God. Israel means prince of God. They were the chosen people. And through the wilderness, they would forget what it was like to be in Egypt and they would begin to complain and then Moses would remind them of the vision, remind them of the promised land. The new generation grew up and they began to take the promised land, but they lost sight of the vision that God had given them. They lost sight of the fact that they were supposed to destroy all the nations that were surrounding them and within their nation. 
and they began to make treaties and peace with the nations around them, even to the point where Israel were actually having orgies with Moabite women that had fallen so far away from what God had called them to do because they lost their purpose and their vision. They lost what they were going towards. You see, God gave each of us a purpose and a vision. He gave each of us dreams of what to do. But when we lose sight of what it is that we are supposed to do, it's very easy to become distracted. And just like Israel, their distraction became their sedation. And then they began losing wars. And then they woke up and they became the people again that they were supposed to be. And this is a cycle that happens in Israel. They win the victory, they lose sight of their purpose, they begin to get distracted, complacent, tolerant, and then they wake up again. And this is their cycle. And us as Christians, we have this same cycle. When things are going great, we forget sometimes that we need to still be cued into God. We need to still be plugged into his word. And we need to be just as alert as when things are going bad. Everything's great, everything's good, we're having a great time, and then we forget to stay plugged in, and we cycle down, and things start to go to messy, things get grubby and messy, and pretty soon, Things get so bad that we can't tolerate it anymore and we wake up and we plug in and we're like, yes, God, yes, God, God, deliver me. Thank you, God. And we climb back up to the top of our mountain. And this is the cycle that we're on because we don't stay plugged in all the time. We become sedated. And when we're sedated, we get distracted. And when we get distracted, the danger creeps in. And then pretty soon we find ourselves in the mess. That's what Israel did. They screwed up time and time and time and time again. If we read the Old Testament, you can see they screwed up. They, they repented. God forgave and delivered them. And then things got great. And then they screwed up and they repented. And God forgave them over and over again. God gave the revelation to the prophets and to the kings to help his people. And that's how they would renew their perspective and begin to jump on their cycle again. Some of us were sedated with the wrong perspective. Like Jonah, he is focused on the wrongs of the people of Nineveh, and he's not focused on God's love and God's forgiveness. You see, Israel had to be forgiven many times, but Jonah doesn't want to share that with the people of Nineveh. Jonah's angry at these people. Maybe they did a terrorist attack. Maybe they did some racism or something that angered the Israelites. And so Jonah, he's afraid of these people. He does not like these people. And he does not want to share God's love with these people. He hates the people of Nineveh. And in that, God tells him to go to Nineveh and share his message so God can share his grace with the Ninevites. And that's where Jonah draws the line and he says, nope, mm -mm, not having any part of this. I hate these people. God, you should just destroy these people. Don't count me as part of this. And he hops on a boat to Tarshish, which is in the opposite direction of Nineveh. But God corrected him. God corrected his course. And Jonah ended up going to Nineveh. And Jonah had the wrong perspective. Jonah was angry after God saved the city. But Jonah's problem was his perspective. Jonah wasn't after the kingdom interests. He was after his self interests. And so sometimes our sedation is that we forgot who we're working for. God gave us a mission and his mission is the commission in the word of God. Before Jesus went up into heaven, he told us in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
So yes, God wants us to be loving to one another. He wants us to share the gospel and make disciples. He wants us to care for the widows and orphans and the impoverished people. Everyone is called with a purpose. This commission is too great for any one person to carry by themselves. We are called to work together. The lionesses hunt together as a team. And just like that, God wants the church to work together. We need to put aside our differences and begin to work together. We need to be the ones bringing the solutions to the world's problems and not just sitting back and waiting to see what's going to happen this time. He doesn't want us to only care about ourself or our self-interest. God wants us to wake up. The world is a hurting place. Children are being trafficked around the world. Christians are being persecuted. It's not just in one place. It's all over the world. Wake up. Use your abilities to make a difference. Don't stay asleep. Take heed in the warnings that I read from Romans and Ephesians. Do not miss what it is that God is doing. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says this, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and the rivers in, and rivers in the desert. Don't remember the way things were before COVID. Don't keep saying, I want things to go back the old way. We already talked about this. That ship is gone. God is doing something new for a new season. God has new methods. It springs forth. Can we not see it? Are we not awake? Are we asleep? Do we not see what it is that God is trying to do right now? He will make a way when there is no way. That's what it means. I will make a way in the wilderness. When there's no way, God's going to make a way. And he's going to give rivers in the desert. So where there is no life, God will give life. It's going to spring forth. So no matter how bad things see, seem to be, when you wake up and plug into God's purpose, you will see what it is that he is doing. And you will see what it is that he wants to do with you. Remember, the Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom and understanding. Your strength comes from the Lord. It does not come from yourself. Ephesians 1 verse 17 through 20 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Right there is a whole fancy way of saying God has given you the wisdom, the revelation, and the knowledge of what you need to do today in your purpose, in your calling, and in your path. God has given you the might, the same might, power that he gave to Christ when he raised him from the dead. That same ability is within you today. That's what that passage is saying. Don't be discouraged. Don't be frustrated. Sometimes it doesn't make sense because sometimes our dreams are so big and God's just going to give you step one. And you have to complete step one before you'll ever get step two. Many times, in the, in the Bible, if we look back, God gives the prophets one step at a time. Go here, now say this, now do this. And the prophet, he doesn't know what the end result's gonna be, but he has to go before he ever gets what to say. And so simply, maybe God is telling you, go. And then when you get there, he's gonna show you what to do. Maybe some of you, you're saying, I'm here. What do I do now? And he's saying, say this. 
but it sounds maybe so ridiculous or crazy or out of place that you're afraid to speak up. God is going to give you the boldness that you need to do what he has called you to do. In 2 Kings, the prophet Elisha told the widow to gather jars. And then he told her to pour the oil. She had to do each step and she had to keep going back to the prophet for each step. She didn't know what the next step would be until the end. She didn't know that she would have enough oil to live off of forever. And so just like that, God's going to give us steps. But you have to have faith and you have to do you have to complete the first step before you get the next step. Many times when Jesus would heal someone, he then gave them directions. One guy was told to go dip in the river seven times before he could get his healing. Each guy had a different set of instructions. And so God will give us our instructions, but he may not always divulge what's going to happen next. We have to have the faith and we have to act upon that. Just like so, when God tells you to do something, God is going to protect you. And I love this analogy here. In the book of Hosea, he's comparing his anger to that of a bear robbed of her cubs or a lion. So if we look at Hosea 13.8, it's, it's, it's just an awesome scripture to tell us about God's protection over us when we act in our purpose and our calling. It says, I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breast, and there I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. So right there, imagine your enemies in that situation. God is going to protect you. If he has called you to do something and you're afraid to stand up and do it, then I hope that this passage will encourage you to do it because God has your back. And the people that come against you, God is gonna deal with them. And I pray for mercy on their souls because God can do so much more than you ever can to them. I like this passage here in Psalms 37 as well. Verse 12, the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. And the Lord laughs at him, the wicked one the one who oppresses the righteous. For he sees that his day of defeat is coming. When people come against you, God is laughing at them. He has your back. Their day is coming. So you can stand up in boldness and do what you are called to do because God has your back. He is the one who gives you the power, the strength, the knowledge and the wisdom and the discernment to do what it is that he has called you to do. And he is also the one who protects you. He has your back. He's not gonna let things happen to you out of time. Like a lion, God is going to protect his children. So it's time for us to rise up and take our place and fulfill our purpose. Be fully awake and spiritually equipped. We should be bold and strategic like the lioness we need to put aside our differences, work together, be a light where you're planted, be filled with the wisdom and the strength that can only come from the Holy Spirit. Live your life on purpose because you have a purpose. The disciples were afraid and they were in hiding. There were some people who were not afraid and they came out of hiding. And there was this lady in the New Testament, her name is Joanna. She's among the few who were not afraid. And she came out of hiding. And we see Joanna only a couple times. Uh, she was with the women who helped Jesus. She was along with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James. And uh, Joanna's backstory here is that she was actually in King Herod's court. She was the wife of a man named Chusa. Chusa was the property manager of King Herod. So she had a very high position. She knew how things worked in order to be in this position. And when John the Baptist was martyred, it impacted Joanna. And Joanna was also mentioned that she was healed from physical illness or spiritual illness. And, and uh, so she was healed by Jesus. 
And so she went around with Jesus and his ministry, and she also helped finance Jesus and his ministry. And when Christ was crucified, she was visible. She was one that was seen with Mary Magdalene. She was not hiding with the other disciples. And when he had risen, she was one of the first women to see the tomb empty. And so the, the reason I share this is because she had a high position. She had money. She could have been worried about losing her status, but she wasn't. She could have been afraid to be seen with Jesus, but she wasn't. She, she was on both sides. She was hanging out with the poor. She was hanging out with Jesus. Jesus was a Jew and Joanna was not. She crossed several lines there. She crossed the line of class. She crossed the line of race. But she didn't care. She was interested in God. She was interested in his power. And throughout the Bible, we find many people who crossed cultural norms and they maybe they didn't do the most politically correct actions, but they did actions that led them to impacting the world for the kingdom of heaven. And they lived their lives on purpose. And so these people we can read about. But before we do, let's take a look at Luke 4, 18 and 19. And this reminds us of what our purpose is. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, Jesus is talking. It's right after his 40 day fast and it's all in the red letters. So Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So just like Jesus knew what his mission was, he knew what he was supposed to do. And right there, he tells us what it is that he came to earth to do. Ours should be similar. Our response to the world, when they ask, what is your purpose? It should be similar. We need to answer and show conviction, not anger. It needs to be one that comes from spending time with the Father in prayer and in the word. The church needs to be awake and dangerous to the enemy. Stop pretending to be good and begin to act the way God called you to. Good behavior does not change the world, nor does following the status quo impact the kingdom of heaven. Here are some people who changed the world, but maybe some of their choices were not the best. Jacob was a deceiver and a trickster, but God chose him to be the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Deborah went against the leaders of her time and rode into battle with the men. When Barak failed at his purpose, she rose to the challenge. She crossed the gender line. It wasn't common for a lady to go into battle. And that's what she crossed. JL chose a gruesome way to kill her enemy. She could have told others, she could have arrested him and handed him over, but instead she drove a, a peg through his brain. She was the judge, jury, and executioner. Tamar was widowed twice, acting as a prostitute, and then she slept with her father-in-law, and it was deemed righteous, and that, that, that son was part of the lineage of Christ. Daniel prayed even after it became illegal. Esther disobeyed the king's orders to save her people, and she risked it all. David committed adultery and murder, and still he's the man after God's own heart. Rahab was a prostitute. She hid the spies, and she became in the, she, she, she's part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Samson was prideful and chased after a sinful lifestyle, yet he had supernatural strength. Mary was pregnant before marriage, and she risked it all for Jesus. Peter was a foolish man, and he denied Christ, yet he was the first one to preach a sermon. Saul, who became Paul, went from a persecutor and a murderer to a martyr for Christ. You get the idea? No one is perfect. Everyone has made mistakes. Their actions still change the world. Politically correct or not does not matter. 
God deemed these people righteous and their actions are remembered today because of the risk that they took. Good behavior does not change the world, but someone who is fully awake to their identity, their purpose and power can change the world. I hope this message has blessed you and encouraged you and I hope you guys have a great afternoon.